University of Montreal and Georgia Institute of Technology. He serves as the Director of Applied Math Institute and leads the Information Research Lab at the University of Alberta. His research interests include mathematical theories of epidemiological models and his modeling experience includes estimation of HIV incidence and prevalence in China in collaborations with China CDC, and TD, TB dynamics on indigenous communities in Alberta and predictions for seasonal influenza in collaboration with Alberta Health. During the COVID-19 pandemic, his research group provided model support for Alberta Health his research programs have been funded by grants from the National Science Foundation, Canadian Foundation for Innovation, NSERC, CIHR, MITAX, PIMS, Fields Institute, and the province of Alberta. And Michael Lee is one of the organizers of um, today's workshop uh, with Jacques, and he's uh, been an incredible uh, leader in this whole program. So it's really great to have him on the panel. And he has um, a very acute understanding of uh, the impact of, of behavior on uh, his models, you know, as we try and predict what's going to happen and then see them not quite performing as, as uh, anticipated. We also welcome um, Joshua Epstein. He's a professor of epidemiology at uh, New York University with affiliated appointments to the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences and the Department of Politics. His external, um, he is external faculty fellow of the Santa Fe Institute and founding director of the NYU agent-based modeling lab. Among his awards are the NIH Director's Pioneer Award and an honorary doctorate of science from Amherst College, his alma mater. He holds a PhD from MIT and before moving to NYU, was professor and director of the Center for Advanced Modeling in the Social, Behavioral and Health Sciences at Johns Hopkins University. He's the author of Nonlinear Dynamics, Mathematical Biology and Social Science, a Wiley publication, Growing Artificial Societies with uh, Robert Axtell, MIT Press, uh, generative social science studies in agent-based computational modeling Princeton and agent zero towards neurocognitive foundations or generative uh, social science Princeton. So welcome um, uh, Joshua. In fact, if we could just, do you mind just spotlighting, um, I was going to ask Sarah to help us out on this. If you could just spotlight uh, Shana, please, and Rebecca, Clementine as well. I don't know if we can fit them all on the screen. Um, and uh, Rebecca, that would be great just get you all assembled in this interesting virtual space. Thank you. Um, so um, perhaps, um, Michael, if you don't mind, I, I would really like it if you were able to just uh, start with giving your, your thoughts on, um, on the presentations and how it kind of links or, or ties in with your experiences at Alberta. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, I'm, I'm so thrilled to, to listen to all these talks and especially Roseanne's talk on the survey and those data and also behavior uh, changes uh, Rebecca talks about. Uh, I was during throughout the epidemic, uh, the pandemic, uh, my group was in the middle of uh, the uh, public health response, uh, providing the data support. Uh, we got a, a really good collaboration going on with uh, Alberta Health and they would, uh, Kim uh, Siemens, who was the panel on the first theme, she was the knowledge translation. And she would have translated the, the public health questions to us uh, into modeling questions. And then so that we can understand what exactly they're asking for. So that we, our groups would meet uh, twice a week and just looking at the questions and start designing models and run it. And then, then we'll report the results back to Kim Kim and with others would, would translate again back to something that the policymaker or public health policymakers, and that would all kind of filter into the public health recommendations to the, the cabinet. And it just somewhere the problem occurred between the course communication between public health and policymakers. Sometimes they, there are recommendations get ignored. So I think that is not unique to Alberta and I'm sure happened to all jurisdictions. But uh, uh, we try the, to, to do the, our diligence. So we use the models and we use all the data we can get. And, uh, but then uh, COVID is very new. There is no past data. There's no past information. We can only rely on the data that's coming. And uh, so, and then we make a lot of mistakes. We, if we try to predict the peak, we see we were hugely over, Projection. Oh, we're checking the peak time, the peak uh, peak height, peak time, 
And uh, we had a very good experience, uh, six year experience predicting influenza, seasonal influenza in Alberta. Using the data, we, for six years, we precisely predicted the week the peak will occur and also how high the peak cases are one month ahead of the peak actually happened. So we were really confident about that. And, uh, but then the COVID, we have uh, influenza, of course, you have past seasons, 10 seasons of the data to inform you what's going to happen uh, typically during the seasonal influenza. So that's a challenge. And uh, then after a couple of weeks, uh, waves later, we have some old data. We were able to build that into the model. It's, it's a, and then we can actually predict forward for one month ahead. We can tell the upper health when the, even the, in the Omicron case, we were able to tell them one month ago that now is the peak time. It's going to come down, even though that you couldn't tell that much from the case detection. And uh, so, and the key there is the, the human behavior. If we don't build that into the human behavior, our standard models always seems to tend to overestimate. And, uh, and also, so the kind of the human behavior we put in is only part of it is, we call it the health seeking behavior, is that uh, when the individual have certain symptoms, how likely this individual will go for help to see a doctor, to get tested, and uh, that we actually have data to inform us for that. Uh, and then there is another type of behavior that's more talked to, you know, the, uh, discussed in these uh, today's talks is we call the self-regulating behavior that has to do with the, how you how people are likely to uh, kind of adhere that say uh, uh, so, uh, hygiene and face masking social distancing those times so that hugely kind of reduce your uh, transmission and. Uh, and then we find out that we actually realize that these types of behavior changes during the epidemic. And that temporal pattern is very important. You, and the standard models are typically using a constant uh, parameter value for different things. And you are basically taking the average of a temporally changing uh, coefficients and that usually creates over projections. And uh, so, so we were, I was hoping someone would tell me how, what kind of data is there so that we can inform us on these self-regulating. Uh, I don't want to hear Roxanne talk. I thought this is fantastic. This is exactly the kind of data we'll be searching. And that would have greatly help us to improve the modeling. So I was very, very excited. So that's, uh, that's my passion for our social behavior. <laughs> okay. yeah. And that's all. Thank you, Michael. I think that does, um, I think all the presentations actually aligned with that, um, this risk of, of uh, and especially over projecting and then losing the trust. So the modelers gain trust, just like you had with flu that people thought, okay, we know what's gonna happen this flu season. And then getting it wrong with COVID, uh, sort of crying wolf and saying it's gonna be extreme. Interestingly, um, I think we've seen, a, we, we have had an impact in Ontario where the, the modeling and the science, we have the scientific advisory table are actually listened to by a lot of people, even when the government doesn't necessarily uh, respond to what their, what, you know, what these results are. And I think we see this health seeking behavior um, among the population who are listening to those broadcasts and those bi-weekly reports. And so that affects their models. They, they made a projection based on, you know, current circumstances. And even if the government doesn't implement uh, any controls at that time, we start to see a change in people's behavior as they, they know there's more risk out there and, and they choose to stay at home or change their plans. And I think in this pandemic, uh, because of the availability of data, we will actually be able to see um, retrospectively what impact modeling has had um, on actually lessening, you know, we think of the classic um, flattening the curve. How many people in Canada had no idea what modeling was all about? And we're all busy flattening the curve in the first wave. I mean, this is incredible. And this is a real, you know, indication of how human behavior uh, could actually, you know, elongate perhaps the, 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 the rate at which we got it. it went over a longer time, but at least that we had time to prepare ourselves and get masks and do those sort of things. So really interesting stuff. Um, Joshua, I just wanted to give you a chance as you're here to, to maybe comment on the on and maybe uh, direct a couple of questions as well. Uh, Josh, I think you're still on mute. If you want to just unmute yourself there. 
Okay, yes, delighted. Great talks all and a wonderful initiative. I think behavior is obviously very central to epidemic dynamics, pandemic dynamics, and so on. Uh, it, in my own work, I'm focused heavily on, on all of this, uh, and I'm not going to go into my work in much, in much detail, but, I, but in my experience with standard modelers, uh, you know, <laughs> when you say, why don't you include behavior? They say, well, it's too hard to include behavior. And my response is, no, you already are including behavior. You're modeling behavior when you say that the infection growth rate is beta SI. SI means there's perfect mixing and people continue mixing, even though there's a plague abroad in their community. So you're modeling behavior, whether you like it or not. So if anybody gives you grief about, oh, you're modeling behavior, you can say you're modeling it too, just very badly. So, uh, and as Michael points out, beta SI, I mean, that runs very hot. It's perfect mixing and that's as hot as an epidemic can go. So uh, all of that is just uh, armament. So let me talk about each of these presentations and hopefully give a little bit of specific uh, feedback. Uh, Roxanne and Clementine, wonderful, wonderful work. Uh, I learned uh, many things, but of course the most important is that I'm a babushka. So that's good to know. And, uh, and I'm very interested. I hope it's in... okay for you. I hope uh, it didn't shock you too much. No, no, I have no problem with it. <laughs> okay, phew. So, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, mask resistance, all these things are are their litmus tests of political fealty. They're not. They're they're beyond uh, health considerations here. But uh, but I liked your curves very much, and especially the ones that change slope. This. Uh, uh, adherence depending on government things. And in my own work, I've tried to study the connection between behavior and the prevalence of disease, not so much government announcements, but prevalence or new cases, either the, the, the extent of the disease in the community or the rate of growth of the disease in the community. And in one of the works, some of the papers I've done are on coupled contagion of fear and disease. So the disease goes up, people get afraid, they distance, that produces a depression in the growth rate, then their fear dissipates, they come back out, but there's still infectives, so the thing blows up again, right? Yeah. still, yeah. So you get these multiple waves from the fear dynamics, which Shana, I've borrowed from the Rascola Wagner equations and my colleague here, Joel Ledoux in neuroscience has helped me develop some simple models of fear that I've put into agents like agent zero and these other things. So I'm very interested in this connection between fear and behavior. And I'm just wondering whether it would be very interesting to see your curves, the ones that go down and go up, plotted against prevalence plotted against new cases. Is that a lag response to increases in cases? Uh, you know, the government in the United States, again, the interesting phenomenon is that you see departures from government, you know, uh, orders, directives, when prevalence falls. I mean, it's not so much conformity to the directives that's interesting here. It's that Departures take place when prevalence falls, even though the directives remain in place. People just say, well, we're going to ignore masks. We're going to have mass gatherings. We're going to have these huge motorcycle uh, festivals in uh, Dakota. You know, so the, the question to me is, can you, can you, how do these things line up against prevalence or perceived prevalence? And on that, I agree with the four T's. The perception of prevalence has everything to do with trust in the government reporting, trust in the CDC. And then when you have leaders casting aspersions on science and the rest of it, it doesn't help people make a rational appraisal of the risks. And so you see more of this dysfunctional behavior. All right. So just as a as a as a as a question, how do those curves look against prevalence or new cases? Uh, that'd be very interesting. Well, for me to know. Um, may, may I just add a little? Yeah, please, please. Yeah. Um, so um, we didn't actually do it, so I can't uh, answer the question and yeah. like how does it vary. But we did have an idea um, brought forth by uh, Ditland in her, our group. I'm not sure if she's here today. I, I think no. But um, she did bring an idea that we wanted to do at some point, which is we have the uh, postal codes of people who answered. So we wanted to match postal codes of 
um, the people in our sample and the infection rates in these areas to check how behaviors varies with uh, local rates of infection, but at a very localized level. So yeah. really um, that allows, because people, like it's one thing to say if um, I take Quebec because that's uh, where I'm from. Yeah. Um, yeah, cases are peaking. There's a lot of people infected, but sometimes people in the regions might be like, yeah, but like more than half of the cases are in Montreal. So it doesn't concern me. So right. um, to check it at a more localized level may more um, like help us really get a sense of, the real risk that people are incurring and how they might perceive it because it's more close to them. So that's something we, that we didn't um, talk about. <laughs> we might no, no, do no, it. I mean, I, point. <laughs> this is not yeah, a criticism of what you've done, which is very interesting. Yeah. I'm just interested in whether, I think that's worth pursuing. Yeah, yeah uh, that, that, that's what I'm saying. We agree. And it is something we talked about. It's just, there's a lot of challenge in, of course, challenges of course, in doing it, but we would yeah. absolutely love to check that interaction. Yeah, 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 well, well, definitely well, something there. Yeah. Great. Love to see what you what you find. May, may uh, I just? Uh, oh, sorry. I just wanted to speak to that as well and just say I think it's an excellent question, um, and I think uh, it's really important to differentiate perceived risk from actual risk as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you rely on self-report and and believe that it's reliable, um, you know, asking people if they actually feel that they're at risk as opposed mm -hmm. to you know some people might not feel that they're at risk even though there truly is an increase in deaths. Um, within their region and so on. So um, something to consider as well. Well, I guess the perception actually determines people's behaviors, right? It's not actually the real risk, it's how they perceive and then determines how they react to it. And if they're trusting yeah. sources yeah. of misinformation or hysterical people or vaccines are gonna stick a Bill Gates chip in your arm, or something, you know, they're believing also they, their trust is misplaced, you know, is, is one issue. So no, you want other, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, had, yeah, I, I have specific right. comments on each talk, but I don't want to interrupt the conversation about them. So, Well, please. we might want to try and just um, come back to some of the questions that came uh, through in the chat. So what I've done, uh, just to, for the people who are listening, is I've, I've tried to cut and paste your, uh, your questions and direct them specifically at the... Um, at the speakers. And so my apologies, because I'm going to ask them to actually have a look through and see if they can answer some of those ones. So I think I've included the names there. If you, if so, I don't know who might want to start. Roxana, did you get yours? You want to have a quick look? Well, I actually, I copy pasted them and I oh, have a list of oh, questions oh, that related to our talk with some answer. prospective answers. So we could start maybe because oh, yeah, we have already fantastic and just, yeah, just to, yeah. Um, so Roxana, do you want me to kind of ask the questions and you can answer? I yeah, you can go, but I don't know if we should answer them all because there's a well, lot maybe of people's just, maybe views. Use, so. use, maybe choose your favorite one. Yeah, but, uh, okay, I'm gonna. Need a, uh, because yeah. we need to leave space for the others to speak. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one of the ones uh, that I, I, I thought was very interesting is how challenging is it to collect the data and connection between data and model uh, that we propose since it involves behavior mo monitoring. So um, that's all. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's, of course, this survey is uh, mostly about perceptions. Of course, we ask like more objective questions, but it's really about perceptions. But we did correlate or link with actual real numbers, like number of cases with some of perception of change, for example. And we saw a relation between the two, like uh, more objective numbers and then how people perceive the situation. So our challenge was to think of all the perceptions, human related factors, including well being, how they perceive sanitary measures, and change over time, and trying to describe the situation as the crisis evolves. So we could try to do our best to inform policies and things. But, you know, you mentioned um, in the beginning that. Um, it's too hard to include behavior. You were speaking of this, too complex. But for me, since I began to study this topic in 97, everyone told me never study social change. You know, it's too hard, it's too complex. <laughs> so here we are with a major pandemic and we don't have much ideas in social psychology, even psychology, how dynamics evolve over time. And we were really surprised by that crisis really because 
Since 97, I work in a silo basically by myself, trying to understand context of great changes and how people cope with it. So the challenge for us was to get organized and, and now is to get into those dynamics of change and looking at postal codes. Because you see, you pointed uh, um, uh, Dr. Lee, in the beginning, that you were interested with these trajectories. And, but when we see numbers like in um, our society, like from Institute, it's mainly numbers that are at one point of time. But so it's average. We have the average. It looks like that. But then when you group people, we find something else. And maybe that's something else. Those who go down versus those who follow the curves, they can play a different role in your mathematical modeling. And that whole thing can be maybe helpful to be more precise and maybe more make less mistake. But I don't know. I'm not a mathematician. But I think maybe there's still a use to, to look at those perceptions over time. And even if it's difficult to work with complex and longitudinal data, we need to invest time now for especially for future crisis. So we are ready to help people in the field, people that are suffering, and of course, inform politics. So that's our vision. And we'd be very happy to deepen those understandings because now, I mean, I'm in psychology, I never did those mathematical things. So I'd be really, really, and our team would be very happy to share our data and collaborate if, if you have some of those expertise, because we're at a stage where we're trying to develop those methods, but it's, it is very complex as social change and as human beings, you know, so that's all I had to say for now. I don't know if it's that helpful, maybe out of focus for the questions, but this is what I think we should remember most about the behavior and change. If I, uh, yeah. I had a quick comment on that. So that's precisely correct. Those data really, really is, uh, would be inform uh, how to incorporate that behavior into the model. I think a lot of that has been considered in Rebecca's model, how you separate the susceptibles depending mm -hmm. on the behaviors. But uh, say, for example, your data considers, uh, contains, uh, proportions of people, fractions of the people yeah. in the population with the different kinds of responses, different behaviors. And that separates the population from population. And that also determines why some provinces or some regions have a lower epidemic, others have a higher. It's just really a lot of it determined by the, the constitu kind of constitution of the population. Uh, how many people are kind of badly behaved, that sort of thing. And uh, also I'm interested in how that fraction changes temporarily during yeah. an epidemic. I think yeah. if you have those kind of data, they'll be just like perfect for us. So that's exactly the data we're looking for. And we're looking forward to talk to you more and the kind of thing, uh, more about this. Yeah. Professor, you Lee, you, Professor Lee can organize another workshop on this. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm happy to do that. <laughs> there's definitely, I think there's a, there, um, but I think there is a lot here and, and I do think that, you know, it's too short a, a time, unfortunately. Shana, do you want to, or are there any questions that, that have popped up that you would like to respond to? Um, I'm happy to. Uh, actually, there was a question about uh, delayed gratification and how that might uh, relate. I think there were actually two questions relating to delayed gratification. Um, I should mention that the term delay discounting, um, it, it's used interchangeably with not, not necessarily delayed gratifications, although sometimes, um, especially in the developmental literature, uh, but especially with uh, temporal discounting, intertemporal choice is really the, uh, the task itself. Um, but we, we actually also, I'm not presenting the data today, tested individuals on discounting of losses as well, which speaks to um, Ali Asghari's uh, question to me. So uh, delay discounting, we used it generally to refer to rewards here, but it also of course could refer to losses. Um, and it does resemble delayed gratification, which is usually used uh, in reference to the marshmallow test and to other developmental tests, um, which use actual tangible objects that have different values. Um, and of course, delayed gratification is the opposite of delay, delaying uh, 
discounting. So uh, in terms of, you know, what it describes in terms of behavior. So um, hopefully that answers that question. There was a, Rebecca asked a, a very interesting question. I'm going to try and pull it up um, just with respect to, um, I think, behaviors uh, that affect the greater good um, as opposed to just an individual. And uh, we use reward, monetary rewards as a proxy because we find that it is a very sensitive marker of a variety of behaviors, but you could certainly set up the question um, in relation to uh, asking about uh, individual versus uh, larger group interests. Um, so, you know, there are many ways to manipulate discounting paradigms or, or intertemporal choice paradigms. Um, finally, I should mention that we did also look at probabilistic discounting so deciding between a certain and less certain reward. Um, but again, I, I'm gonna leave that for now. It's a bit of a complicated story, um, but the delayed discounting data really fits with what we've found in the past. Wanna go ahead and- Yes, please. Okay, so Rebecca, I mean, uh, I'm Shana, so sorry. It's, it's great stuff. Uh, vaccine refusal obviously is a, a huge deal. Again, I mean, I've tried to build uh, these fear, in, we published something in Royal Society recently with a colleague at Courant on, on models with two fears, fear of the disease and fear of the vaccine. <laughs> and they're both contagious and can both be ill-founded or well-founded and so forth. But the interesting simple point is that if the fear of disease exceeds the fear of vaccine, as when the disease is big, people take the vaccine, but that suppresses the disease. Now they're not so afraid of the disease and they're more afraid of the vaccine and they stop taking the vaccine and the thing comes back, which is exactly what you see in historic smallpox, cycles of vigilance and complacency are all based on these, on these same things. In any event, I love this idea of introducing the theory of intertemporal choice into uh, epidemiology. And uh, I was just curious in your, and I, I'm very fascinated at the idea of intervening in it somehow with queuing or other, other blocking or other sorts of, sorts of methods. But I'm wondering, do you think of the degree of discounting as fixed in the individual or as a function of conformity effects or social network dynamics? Or is it learned and acquired the way associative fear conditioning happens? I'm just curious whether you think of it as a, as, as a modeler, is it something that's an endowment of the agent or is it something that the agent comes in with some initial setting that's influenced by his environment, his social experience, what have you? It's an excellent question. And I don't think that there's a clear answer as of yet um, from my reading of the literature, my understanding, or at least in terms of some of the data that we've collected in the past and even during COVID when we repeat testing of individuals, even on the same day, on the same paradigm, they will tell us the strategy that they use. They might consider inflation or they might just um, base it on a gut feeling. Um, so that suggests some implicit influences, of course. Um, we find that individuals are consistent, but there is quite a bit of intra-individual variability in their discounting. It's usually within a tight range, but it can vary from one uh, one administration to another, even like I said, on the same day, which is surprising. Um, as we've seen, and we've actually looked at the relationship between the, the individual variables like income, um, even coming from an, a place that is, uh, that shows a lot of income instability or income inequality. Uh, we, we in fact tested individuals from South Africa, which has a very high uh, Gini index. And um, we found that we find in other work uh, some work actually that was led by my colleague Kai Ruggieri that uh, income inequality is high or delay discounting is highly sensitive to income inequality and you tend to see much steeper discounting in those cases. So understanding or modeling all of these many variables and the complexities of them um, with respect to delay discounting I think is very important. Um, but at least in our simple model with the variables that we included it does seem that delay discounting still explains vaccine compliance in our samples um, and in multiple samples actually um, very important. over very important. and above those other variables. Yeah. And I also thought it was very interesting. I don't know what, what you're finding on the, you know, prospect theory and is all about the asymmetry between gains and losses. And I'm wondering whether the yes. discounting, how they look on the gain side versus the losses side. I'm sure that's very interesting. Yeah. So far and, our, our data are conforming to yeah. the predictions of prospect theory nice. um, on losses versus gains. Terrific. All great. All right. So uh, 
I have other comments on Rebecca's talk, or would you like to stop well, would, and have a group discussion of Shana's talk, or what well, would you I like to I do? Might, I might just ask um, Rebecca, if because I know she's had a look at some of the questions as well. If there's one there that, she, yeah, that was course. interesting that she'd like to just have a go at. Yeah, sorry, I've been busy, busy looking at them, coming up with answers. Um, one, one person pointed out that a bilateral influence function where both people are, are influenced uh, might be more realistic. I, I acknowledge that. <laughs> uh, that would probably be an interesting avenue to pursue. Um, and then uh, someone asked how we decided on our assumptions. I mean, most of them were for mathematical tractability, just starting with a simple, how, do, how does this work in a very simple model? And then the intention is that it should grow from there. And, and I think the world is your oyster pretty much in terms of adding on important behavioral um, uh, interactions between people. Why did we choose a discrete attitude scale? Oh, we never thought of a continuous one. Uh, of course, if we had a continuous one, then you the ODEs would become unmanageable um, because now you don't have one ODE for each population group. You, you've got to integrate. And so that's a whole other ball of wax. Uh, with the agent-based model, we, we probably could have had a scale. Then we'd have another decision to make. You know, How much does each group influence the other. So again, it's just a question of, of how do you want to model these groups, but there's no reason why you couldn't look at a continuous scale in a different modeling framework. Um, I was asked uh, a couple of interesting questions about um, how my work relates to other work. Uh, what the other work uh, listed was sentiment analysis models over networks and rumor spreading models in social networks. So we didn't look at networks, we just had a grid. And so of course that's that's quite different. And we know that networks um, do have a strong effect on population dynamics. And so I, I, I think that that's an important, another important next step in this work. Um, and then I, someone sent a quote from Upton Sinclair. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. And does this have an effect? And of course, I could be flip and say, well, if it was a woman, we'd be fine. But um, on the other, being, being a little less flip, yes, I'm sure that does have, have an important effect. And, and that, would, that would be in the rate at which one is willing to, to switch opinions or switch attitudes. Um, and so we can get at that a little bit that way, but there's more to be included in that uh, that area as well. Okay, I think that deals with most of them. Hi. Are you I, itching? I can see you're itching to jump in, go on. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm cool anyway. First, please say hello to Bert Baumgartner for me. Oh, he's uh, awesome, yes, absolutely. He's a wonderful guy. I haven't seen him in a long time. We talked when I was at Hopkins and uh, just please oh, okay. give, him a, give him a hug for me. All right, so- uh, I will. So it's a, I, I, the work is very interesting, commendable effort to do both opinion dynamics and uh, inject opinion dynamics into epi modeling. Uh, yes, I, since you've already answered it, I'll just second the motion that, you know, the influence function is sender only. And, you know, you might have a second receiver propensity function or handle that in different ways, but it's a little bit, you know, you should consider extending that so that the receiver is also in the transaction. Uh, I was curious, purely on the opinion dynamics ODEs, did you actually solve for an equilibrium and explore its stability? <laughs> I mean, I'm yes. just curious, is there a unique equilibrium? Are there several, are there limit cycles? Is there anything dynamically, you know, yeah. exotic about that setup? I'm just curious how much you pursued that, just mathematically. Right, <laughs> so there are several equilibria and they're all saddles. Ah, okay. So, so numerically, it's actually a real pain. Um, but, but yeah, I, we were able to do a little bit of analysis. It's fun. You can you can simplify it down to a two equation system uh, at the very beginning, and then a two equation system towards the end. And you can show how you can prove you can show that the population will evolve the way we expect from being centered to being polarized. Mm -hmm. So yes, we could do some of that, but no cycles. They're all saddles. Interesting. Interesting. In two dimensions, you can't get only that. By What's index, that? By index theory, you can't get two, only two saddles in the plane. But that's, you're not in the plane, you're in four dimensions. So, yeah, well, that was I just that's it. possible. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, what was the other thing I was just going to, again, I just think you should try to be, I mean, you know, 
a little bit diligent in distinguishing between the number of opinions and the spectrum of strengths yeah. with which they are held. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and polarization is just really what you're showing is is polarization on strength, not yeah, not that the positions are extreme. The positions are just you know one or minus one really. They're signum yeah. A. Um, yeah. And just otherwise, that's 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 the only thing. I thought it was very interesting to try to. Do. The, the other question I had on on prophylaxis, did you include the effectiveness of the prophylaxis? I saw low, medium, and high, but I didn't see anything about how effective it is. And I wondered whether that isn't an important assumption. Well, so that was all rolled in, right, under, under the hood. So so the, the fact that the high prophylactic group had a lower uh, transmission rate of disease, I the see. assumption was that that the, the attitude and the behavior were inextricably linked <laughs> and meant the same thing. Right. So, so yeah. We didn't, we didn't consider them as separate. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to check again. I'm not sure. Heteroclinic orbit connecting saddle may be permitted from the plane. I don't have to check. But anyway, this is all <laughs> phase plane goody. Anyway, it's all great. And I think it's uh, just commendable. I hope we keep, the, keep this going because I really think it's extremely important to the future of epidemiology and public policy to understand how behavior enters in. And as the panel shows, it enters in in many interesting and undoubtedly coupled ways. So I just think this is a great group that we should keep going. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'd just like to say that I've been, I've been trying to answer all the questions that were sent to me directly in the chat. And if I missed anything from anybody, please send me an email. <laughs> Yeah, well, that is kind of you, Rebecca, because we unfortunately we did get a bit squashed at time at the beginning. So yeah. um, we have actually reached the end. I think we probably have, we pro maybe have, maybe it'd be nice to hear from Michael, actually. I mean, Michael's been so um, important in organizing this whole theme and the workshop. So Michael, do you want to have just some final remarks on, on this theme? And, uh, and and then we'll we'll close and we'll reopen again at 3.30 for the next one. So Might I just add a little thing uh, before? Oh, just uh, everyone, you can also send uh, me or her some questions. And there was a lot of questions like technical and we added some slides to what we're going to send you. So there might be answers in there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Michael, do you have a stuff as well, a final I word? just uh, appreciate all the uh, discussions and the panels and also the, the, the talks. <clears throat> I think uh, we're, the pandemic really told us we really need to incorporate the human behaviors into our model, epidemic model. This is probably a new kind of a new phase in the model development. We, we've been looking at a theoretical model for so long. But then the, the pandemics tell us, well, you need something more in your model to be reliable. And that's something we're going to pursue from now. Yeah. We're, 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 yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, I was yeah, just going to yeah. say on the, on the empirical side, there's all this wonderful work on yeah. yep. mining <laughs> social media to extract yep. attitudes, sentiments, fears. Exactly. We have some work funded by NSF to try to right. try to do Twitter mining. So, I mean, it may be that we can actually have better data on these attitudes and their transmission right. and, and so on. So I think it's a very, very rich yeah, yeah. and crucially important area. Yeah, I think this is a really good step for us to talk yeah. and uh, collaborate, and then we will get a much better formulated models yeah. and it would be much more useful for public health. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, uh, for attending today. A special thank you to our speakers. Uh, incredibly insightful and real learning. So it's really wonderful to hear your research and all kinds of new new um, things that I hadn't considered. So thank you. And of course, we, we were working on a, on a survey as well on behaviors. So a lot of this, we can bring that theory in and start to look at, at, at these uh, attitudes that we've been observing and, and see, maybe look for some explanations as to why. And, and I think all this will help us prepare for what is coming in the future in terms of the, the pandemic or the endemic for sure. And, but also that we might be in a better position um, to take a, a more of a health equity lens as we, we go into other threats. And we certainly see that with a global, global climate change emergency that, that we have some really tricky problems coming and we need to think about how those are gonna impact uh, different population groups and what we can do to be more protective um, of, of them. So thank you so much. It's been a really great session. Uh, for those of you